Good morning, Sylvester. Good morning. Wonderful to see all the smiling faces here to worship our Lord and Savior, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We give you thanks for coming in your cars, bringing your chairs with you. Welcome any and all entourages to this worship service. Tune to 91.9 on your FM dial if you're in your cars. And sing along with us. 10,000 reasons.
necessary for us to worship you in spirit and in truth this day. Father, we pray that our hearts would turn towards you just now and that you would you would just fill us with your love and let us overflow. And dear Father, we pray for, for our Pastor Simon. We pray that he's having a good vacation and we send our love through you to him today. Father, watch over this service and just bless us with, with your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Here we go. And open the gym. An announcement. An announcement. Oh, I almost forgot announcements. Steve, do you have an announcement? Yes, I do have an announcement. Uh, Pastor Simon is gone today and next Sunday. He's taking a vacation. And, uh, and we're glad for that. Um, so he sent a note, though, that says, Dear Church Family, we're on vacation now, but we wanted to say a huge thank you for your kindness and generosity in the monetary gift you gave us, and also the many cards we received. You are each such an encouragement to us and a blessing. We love you guys. We're thinking of you while on vacation. Well, okay, not too much. <laughs> we have our orders. We told our luggage that we will not be flying to England to see family either, as we truly need a vacation. So we now have emotional baggage. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Simon couldn't resist leaving you with at least one bad joke. <laughs> you will be blessed by Steve and Tim as they preach both Sundays. We look forward to seeing you when we get back. Blessing Simon, Laura, and Aaliyah. Well, let's sing some more. Let's sing about God's grace and how great it is. Sing the first and last verse of Praise and Holy Spirit. Thank you. 
Amen. Amen. A good song. Good singing. Now, matters of prayer and praise. Jesus, it's such a comfort to be able to come to you and uh, know that you love us and that you have the best in store for us and want the best and that uh, we don't need to fret about that or worry about what you will do, Lord, but that it will always be uh, you have our best interests in your heart and not only just have that, but you can do anything that you would like to, Lord, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. morning scripture reading is from Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 18. Paul writes, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should also look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Amen. Thank you, Mike. You know, i got to stop encouraging pastors to take vacations because I then find myself up here uh, when they do that. Uh, brought this basketball because I wanted to brag on my basketball skills a little bit for you this morning. I didn't always get that chance, but uh, just a quick basketball story. A few years ago, um, I was invited by some friends to participate in a three-on-three -three tournament in the 50 and older eighth bracket. So it play is kind of slow at that age, but uh, <laughs> I am happy to report that uh, we took second place in the tournament and uh, lost only two games in the whole tournament. Wow. Hey Josh, are you impressed? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Listen to the rest of the story. Um, there were only three teams. There were only two teams. <laughs> played that other team twice and lost both games. <laughs> but we did get a nice second place trophy for it, which I don't have any longer. For some reason I got rid of that. But, uh, I relate that story because uh, numbers don't always tell you the whole truth or all sides of something when you hear them and that they can sometimes be uh, taken in different ways. I'm going to be sharing some numbers with you later this morning and so uh, we'll just take those with a grain of salt when we hear those. Today our scripture reading in Philippians said uh, in verses 14 and 15, do everything without grumbling or complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. Then you will shine like stars in the sky, or as Mike's version said, stars in the universe. And that's what I want to address today is the idea of shining like stars. 
couple of weeks ago, Pastor Simon mentioned during this time that uh, with the COVID virus, how much uh, hardship is going on. Experienced economic hardships, uh, relational problems, domestic violence, uh, <clears throat> losing loved ones, uh, not being able to visit loved ones, all the uncertainty with government regulations. It seems like things change from day to day, from moment to moment, and uh, it's just a lot of, uh, it seems like a lot of tension and a lot of changes that uh, we aren't always comfortable with. Um, so my thought when he mentioned that was how, as Christians, are we handling this? And I got to admit that uh, it wasn't, but shortly after that, I had that thought and, and heard that from Simon that I found myself in a situation where I was saying and acting like I didn't want or shouldn't have been. Uh, was not shining like a star at all, but was instead uh, being the very opposite. And uh, shortly after I had said some things, I got home and, and God's saying, uh, Steve, uh, that wasn't right. And so I ended up uh, apologizing, and, and fortunately the person was very forgiving, and, and uh, things got back on track, and, and uh, things were going fine. But uh, it just it's, it impressed on me how difficult it is for us to shine like stars. And then I read some articles, and I don't know if you've heard of uh, George Barna, but I've always been a fan of him. He's a Christian poll taker that uh, surveys uh, usually different Christian groups, and then takes the results of those surveys and can point out different trends. And again, let me caution you that with these numbers, they're not always absolutes, but they do kind of give us an indicator sometimes of a bigger picture than we're aware of. So this first article I looked at was really the result of two different polls. He polled pastors to see what pastors thought about how their congregations were doing. And then he also polled the congregants of different churches to see what their, how they thought they were doing. Here's what the article uh, title says. Survey shows pastors claim congregants are deeply committed to God. Sounds pretty good. Congregants deny it. So in other words, the results of the congregation survey show that we're not deeply committed to God. In fact, this, this line out of the uh, results, I found kind of uh, it caused a little ouch in my spirit. It said, the lifestyle of most church adults is essentially indistinguishable from that of unchurched adults. Mm -hmm. uh, let that sink in for a moment. Um, I wasn't comfortable hearing that uh, or reading that. Second uh, article I looked at, the title was, Are Christians more like Jesus or more like the Pharisees? And survey says 14% or about one out of every seven Christians seem to represent the actions and attitudes that Barna researchers found to be consistent with those of Jesus. So one out of seven of us. And again, this was Barna researchers and their thoughts of what's, you know, the attitudes and actions of Jesus. Um, and again, it's not speaking and saying, absolute, this is everybody. Um, but enough to give us a trend. Then a few years ago, Gail uh, and I were at, I think it was at a, a wedding that one of our nephews was at, and uh, he came up to us and he was saying how uh, he has some non-Christian friends and that they complained to him about how they were treated and judged by Christians. And our nephew responded to them that uh, he knew some Christians, at that point it was our family, because um, we, we were related, and uh, he said he thought we were pretty strange at times, but that we didn't judge him or treat him unfairly, but, but that he thought that this family was accepted, and uh, um, which was kind of nice for us to hear, the fact that he, he uh, didn't feel like we were rejecting him, but, and it was interesting to, him to find that he thought we were pretty strange. Um, but he did say, now that he's a Christian, he says, uh, I get it. It's why we were that strange. Um, but that fits in with the third article I looked at, which said 84% of young, of young non-Christians say that they know a Christian personally, yet only 15% of those say the lifestyles of those believers are noticeably different in a good way. So, 
I guess what I'm trying to point out is that uh, in Philippians, when it says shining like stars, that maybe there's some room for some improvement on our parts. And I don't say this to beat ourselves up and, and say, oh, we've got to dig in and grit our teeth and go after this harder. But as uh, an encouragement to me, I like to have a little bit of motivation. And, and, uh, and we'll get to more of that later on. But uh, I do want to mention Romans 3.23 says that we've all sinned and fallen short. And so we are going to fail at times. And sometimes people look at Christians and they hold us to that higher standard. And so when we do fail, they go, aha, I knew it. You're not perfect. Well, I think we already do that. Uh, in fact, anybody that's a Christian has said to God, God, I know I'm not perfect. I have failed. I have sinned. And thank you for your grace that I have eternal life. So it's not news to us when we fail um, and that we're not perfect. I like this quote. Oh. Um, by Rick Warren, a, a pastor and Christian author. He says, our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. Have you run across some of that, someone like that where uh, you're talking to them and, and uh, they may, you may express a belief, uh, a biblical truth, and and their reaction is, oh, you, you hate me because of what you just said. Even though there was no hate in what your intent or what you're saying, it's just the fact that you uh, disagreed with their lifestyle. Or it says the second thing is that loving someone means you agree with everything they say or do. The husbands and wives, you love each other. <laughs> do you agree with everything they say and do? <laughs> Jan? <laughs> I know that Richard agrees with you. Though. I'm very agreeable. Yeah. <laughs> um, Rick Warren goes on to say both of those statements are nonsense. You don't have to compromise your convictions to be compassionate. So I guess what I'm saying is that there's times when we're going to do everything right and it's still going to come across to someone as you hate me or you don't love me. Um, you know, think about your own, those of you that have kids. Have your kids ever said something along the lines of, you don't love me or you don't like me because you made me do this or do that kind of thing? Uh, and yet as parents, uh, we know that we love our kids and when we have them do things just out of a love, not out of a, certainly not out of a hate. How many of you remember WWJD? Yeah. Count of three, tell me what that is. One, two, three. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Yeah, that was a popular movement back in the 1990s. So, Natalie, probably a little bit before your time. But maybe you still heard of that, I don't know. Um, but many people wore bracelets with WWJD to maybe signify that they're Christians or to serve as a reminder to, okay, I want to uh, act with Jesus' actions and attitudes. I was looking into that a little bit, and I found out that that was actually based on a book written back in the 1890s by uh, Charles Sheldon entitled, In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? So it wasn't a new trend that came across, you know, not like, much like we'd like to think, oh yeah, we were part of this new idea. It's been around for a while. In fact, as I think about it, and Christians grappling with the idea of shining like stars, uh, Paul was the one that was writing that to the church at Philippi at the time, and that's probably when the struggle of shining like stars was beginning way back at that time, that this has been something that Christians have always been working on. So, how do we grow as Christians and shine like stars? I want to look at three different steps. Number one I already mentioned was becoming a Christian. Um, Paul talking in 1 Timothy says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience <coughs> as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. In that, those verses Paul has presented the gospel to us, that while he was a sinner, God's grace was poured out on him, 
by Jesus coming into the world to save sinners. We need to believe on Jesus and receive eternal life. I would urge anyone listening, if you're not a Christian, to please take up Jesus on this offer of grace. It's a gift. It's not something that we need to work for or earn, and that's not what this is about today, that as we work on shining like stars, we are not working on becoming Christians. This verses that Paul wrote were written to Christians, saying, Christians, here's what I'd like you to do to work out your salvation, not to earn your salvation. Last week, Pastor Simon talked about Romans 8. It says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. And Simon said that there's a lot in that verse that he wasn't going to touch, and if he wasn't going to touch it, then I'm not going to go anywhere near it either. Um, but it does say conform to the likeness of his son. And then in chapter 12, it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I'd like to take a look at the scripture that Mike read this morning in Philippians, to see how maybe we can be transformed and conform ourselves more to be like Jesus. It starts out with saying, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common fellowship or sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and, passion and compassion. What he's saying here is that as Christians, we experience blessings. We get to have that fellowship of being able to come here together as fellow believers uh, whether it's out of the tent or in our cars or those people that will be listening later on. In fact, I'd like to keep the people that are unable to attend right now for whatever reasons, keep those people especially in your prayers because uh, I know a lot of them would love to be here with us and for various reasons just can't at this point. And think about that. They're missing out on some of the fellowship that we're able to experience here. We're not able to experience the full fellowship that we're used to. But at least we were able to have some of that contact that uh, some people are still being denied. Um, so we've got the blessings of being a Christian. And then these next verses say, that make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. In other words, Paul is saying, we are motivated by Jesus' love and sacrifice. That the love of God in us and our love for God and our love for one another is what is going to pass on the blessings of being a Christian to others. That we're going to glorify God and shine like stars. And it's also cautioning, cautioning, cautioning us on staying together and not becoming divided. Don't let ourselves, it's so easy, it seems like in this time right now, there's a lot of division in our country. And as Christians, we need to say, yes, there's things going on that uh, are troubling, that I maybe don't agree with, or there's problems, but I wanna put my focus on Jesus and say, he's my priority. And look at how he would handle this and not get caught up I was reading something on uh, Facebook a couple days ago, and I've got to stay away from that sometimes because I'll start to read not only what was posted, but then I'll get into the comments, and the comments get to be pretty crazy. And if I immerse myself in those, then all of a sudden I feel like that craziness is now descended on me, and I, skip, I take that on. Um, I just want to also mention that being like-minded doesn't necessarily mean we have to agree on everything. It's not saying that... I think it is saying, though, that we agree that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Amen. And that we'll keep our focus on Him. Do nothing out of selfish ambition, ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, Mike's version said not looking uh, only to your own interests. This one says not looking to your interests, but just to the interests of others. It brought up uh, an interesting thought for me. I don't know how many people we have here today or be listening, but let's just put it at 100 people between under the tent and cars and listening later on. If we each focus on ourselves, like it just told us not to do, then how many people do I have that are concerned about me? One, me. If we all do what it says and instead we put our focus on what is best for everybody else, how many people are then concerned about me? 99 in this case. So ask yourselves, would you rather have one person be concerned about you or 99 people 
looking after your interests. I think that we'd all prefer to have the 99, although we want to struggle sometimes to still put ourselves, say, oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. But I think I'll, I'll, I'll trust, I'll trust my fellow Christians on that one. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset or attitude as Christ Jesus. I want you to listen for the words in this passage now that describe Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Did you hear servant and humble and obedient? In fact, obedient to death? At this point, some people say, when they hear this, they say, but won't people take advantage of you? Aren't you going to be walked all over as you try to consider other people's interests and put them first? Picture Jesus on the cross. At this point, I think people were walking all over him. They had beaten him and uh, mocked him. They had nailed him to the cross. They had lifted him up. Why did he do that? Because it he knew what God's purpose was for him. Did Jesus want to go through that suffering? No, he wanted to do what God had for him. But Jesus had asked earlier, hey, if this can pass by, I don't, I don't need to do this if there's any other way. And, and yet he said, I'll do this. Also consider that when Jesus was up on that cross, that wasn't a sign of weakness or being walked on by other people. I look at that and say, what a, a magnificent strength it must have taken for him to stay on that cross. To be the God of the universe and to have all these insignificant people mocking him, making fun of him, hurting him, when any, at any point he could have just, he could have just said, hey, uh, I don't want this. I'm going to end this. And it was in his power to, to just put a halt to it. He didn't have to do that. His strength kept him there for us. Not, it wasn't a weakness on his part at all. <clears throat> Verse 12 goes on to say, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only my presence, but now much more my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. As I mentioned earlier, this verse gets uh, misunderstood. It speaks of ongoing obedience for those already saved. It is not saying that we need to work on earning our salvation. There are some people that feel like, like before I come to church, I've got to get my act together. I've got to turn my life around, then I'll be able to come to church. And God is not saying that at all. He's saying, come to me, I will heal you. Uh, I'll let me be a part of your life. Uh, I can help you get your life put back together again. So Paul, when he's talking about working out our salvation, again, it's, he's asking us to recognize that, yes, we are saved. We have eternal life. What does God want for me next? Do everything without grumbling or complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation everything. It doesn't give us much wiggle room on that as far as the arguing and the playing. It's uh, do everything. Then you'll shine like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I not run or labor in vain. This is just the start. The scriptures are full of verses that flesh out what it means to have the attitude and actions of Jesus Christ. Which leads me to the final step today. We, got, we became a Christian. We look at the attitudes and actions of Jesus so we know what we can perform to. The third step, the fact that you hear shows me you already know that, is that you choose to be intentional about pursuing the characteristics of Jesus. One of those ways is by coming to church and being part of a church family so that we can encourage one another. I got my elementary teaching degree at age 22, so 
a few years ago. And uh, I remember looking back at that time, after I'd been teaching for several years, I looked back and pictured how I was in that first classroom. My first classroom was a second grade classroom. I was 22 years old and uh, had all the, you know, the, the certification. But uh, looking back on that, I could realize, boy, Steve, you were quite the rookie at that time. You know, it, I, the new teacher and how over the years uh, I refined different things and hopefully got better at some things with the experience. And, and uh, of course, part of teaching was going to ongoing courses to maintain certification, uh, going to different seminars. I remember every time I go to a seminar, my goal would be I want to come away with at least one thing that when I go back to my classroom, this will help me in my classroom. And, uh, and as a teacher, other teachers also, I think, echo this, that you're probably almost always thinking about what can I take back to my classroom to make it better. I, wanna, I want things better for my kids. But I think that's true probably any profession that, uh, Jan, in nursing, did you ever have to take ongoing education or were you just all set for when you you still have to take it. Still have to take it, right? Yeah. Why? You keep me up to date and make sure I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. Keep, keep you up to date, doing the right thing, getting better at what we're doing. Our experiences help us with that. Think back to those of you, your first days on a job, how that felt when the, you know, the first time, whatever that was, how uh, maybe uncomfortable it was because you're just trying to learn things and you're scrambling and you're thinking, oh boy, how do I do these things? Then you look at it later on and you think, well, now this seems pretty easy, what I'm doing. You know, you're, or you're more comfortable with that. The idea is that experience and teaching gets us better. Well, I'm thinking as Christians, are we going to be any different? I became a Christian when I was eight years old. You would think by now I would be good at it. Okay? Um, maybe I need to be a little bit more intentional as far as, okay, what can I do? Because, uh, let's see, if I was eight years old, yeah, that gives me a lot of years of experience. Um, that as Christians, what can we do to be intentional about that growth though so we're not just sitting back saying, yeah, I, I'm, thankfully I'm all set, I'm saved. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but hey, I'm all set. Um, I don't think that's the attitude that Jesus had then. If it wasn't, he wouldn't have stayed on the cross because he was all set um, and we weren't. So I think uh, it's great that we have some Bible studies starting up this next week on Wednesday, because that's part of the being intentional and saying, how can I improve? Because God's given us his word. Uh, in fact, i got to mention this, because you, know, you know how I am as far as Bible reading plans, that uh, I encourage people to read the Bible. Gail was asking me the other day, she says, how come you got all this junk in your Bible? I don't know if she said junk, but you know, it was kind of like, you know, really? And uh, I said, well, um, on that Bible reading plan, and it has me reading in the Old Testament, so that's what this marks for. Then it has me reading in Proverbs, that's what this book marks for. Then I'm reading in the Gospels, so that's this one, and then this one, I'm in 1 Timothy right now. So that's what all these different papers are for, they're my bookmarks. And uh, so the idea though is I want to encourage you to uh, take time to read this. I read the Bible, and I, I certainly don't understand all of it maybe not even much of it. It's interesting how many, as I read verses for a second or third time or more, I think, how did I miss that the first time? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just that God gives me what I can handle, which isn't a whole lot, but then also uh, reveals to me, I think, new things that are appropriate to where I am at a particular time. And so I encourage you to uh, spend time with reading the Bible, spend time in prayer, um, and let me close with this. You know, Simon talks about, let's uh, see if we can get this plane, land this plane. I was thinking I'm not even sure if I can get the plane to take off, but uh, we'll see. John says in, uh, in the book of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness is not understood. So let's take that light of Jesus that shines in the darkness, and let's see if we can also, with Jesus' light, uh, let's shine for him. 
Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you don't ever give up on us, uh, that you have abundant grace and mercy for us, that when we fall, you are there to pick us up, you're there to prop us up. Lord, you uh, give us everything that we need. I thank you, Lord, for the encouragement of the church body, and I pray, Lord, that we can, uh, we can encourage one another and sharpen one another, Lord, that it results in your kingdom growing, Lord, as we are able to shine for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a new song to learn. We're going to sing it through you one for you first, and then you'll join us and we'll sing it twice again. It's a short chorus, and you know the melody. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel by clicking the link on the upper left hand side of your screen so you can see all of our videos when they come out. Or you can watch last Sunday's sermon by clicking the video link on the bottom left of your screen. From all of us at Sylvester Community Church, thank you and God bless.